In the modern era, most decks usually tend to avoid running normal monsters, since most of the time it's better to play monsters with beneficial effects rather than just a vanilla beater that doesn't do anything else. But they haven't been power crept out of the game entirely. In fact, there are a ton of strategies and cards in the game that revolve around non-effect monsters and innovate how normal monsters are used, to the point where in recent years a ton of vanillas have seen quite a bit of competitive play. So in this video, we're going over 10 more of the best normal monster support cards in the game, what they do, and how some have managed to make monsters with no effects legitimate meta threats. And swinging in at number 10, we have the Giant Ballpark. One of the most interesting field spells in the game that acts as a foolish burial, a monster reborn, and a soul charge from the deck for normal insect monsters. Ballpark has two effects, with each one being a hard once per turn. Its second effect is pretty good and activates whenever any monster you control is sent to the graveyard by opponent's card effect and lets you special summon any normal insect monster from your graveyard for free. But it's Ballpark's first effect which makes it so absurd because during either player's turn, during damage calculation, if either player would take battle damage, you could make it so that neither player will take any damage from that battle. And that's not all. Because then you get to send any level 4 lower insect monster from your deck to the graveyard, including effect monsters. But if you choose to send a normal monster, you can then special summon three copies of that normal monster from your hand deck or graveyard. These effects are incredibly strong. Being able to foolish any level 4 or lower insect monster means that Ballpark works really well with insect effect monsters with powerful graveyard effects, like Goki Pole or Resonance Insect. But by choosing to send a normal monster instead, you're rewarded with a ton of bodies on field that you can use for extract plays, or to just do a ton of damage to your opponent's life points. However, an unfortunate downside of Giant Ballpark is that its first effect can only ever be used during the battle phase, which means that you're never going to be able to use it on your first turn. As a result, most Giant Ballpark decks are centered around OTKing your opponent as quickly as possible. This meant that the best choices for normal monsters to be used with Giant Ballpark were the ones with the highest attack, like Insect Knight, which has an impressive 1900 attack, or more commonly, Shiny Black Sea Squatter being used because of its staggering 2000 attack. This meant that on an open board, a Giant Ballpark activation gets you 6000 points of damage by itself, making it incredibly easy to OTK so long as you have at least one more beater with a decently high attack. And even if you don't manage to actually OTK, you have three bodies which you can use for extract plays to go into things like Baguska or IP Mascarina. Now, unfortunately, Ballpark needing the battle phase to get access to its crazy effects is still a huge downside, so it hasn't seen too much competitive play since its release. However, the card still has a ton of potential, especially since you also have the option of sending insect effect monsters. But as of right now, it is at least really cool that it at least makes some really cool normal monsters part of your main game plan. Gunning in for number 9 is Magnificent Magic Key Maftiel, the only non-ritual main deck effect monster of the Magic Key archetype. A deck centered around using Kafkis the Magic Key Skyblaster, alongside other different attribute normal monsters to go into your Magic Key Ritual and Extra Deck monsters. Maftiel is a tutor monster with two effects and one condition. Its condition states that it can't be used as a Synchro or Xyz material unless it's specifically for the Synchro or Xyz summon of a Magic Key monster. This seems like a big downside, but Maftiel's two effects more than make up for it because its first effect gives you a free extra normal summon of any Magic Key monster by revealing Maftiel in your hand while you control a Magic Key monster. Now, because Magic Key only has two normal summon of monsters in its main deck, you're usually going to use this effect to summon out your revealed Maftiel, which is great because Maftiel's on summon effect is superb, because whenever it's normal summon, you get to target either a level 4 lower normal monster or a level 4 lower Magic Key monster in your graveyard and special summon to the field in defense position. This makes Maftiel an excellent extender, especially because this extra normal summon doesn't need to be used immediately. So you can reveal your Maftiel in hand while you control a Clavicus, use Clavicus for an extra deck play, then normal summon out Maftiel to bring back the Clavicus so you have a really easy way of accessing the Magic Key extra deck boss. But you don't even need to bring back Clavicus because Maftiel can bring back any level 4 or lower normal monster. This is important because one of Magic Key's big gimmicks is having a ton of normal monsters with different attributes in your graveyard in hopes that one of them matches the attribute of the deck that your opponent is playing, so that you can gain access to the bonus effects of cards like Androbrime and Gareglasser. And it can fill the graveyard pretty easily thanks to the Magic Key Maftil and Advanced Ritual Art. As a result, Magic Key decks are usually fairly normal monster heavy, and allow for a ton of different normal monsters to see play depending on what decks are currently in the meta. You don't need to worry too much about light or dark decks since both Maftil and Clavkiss are light and dark respectively. But if you needed to counter a fire attribute strategy, the deck would run Gukin Suship Shari. Phantom Griffin for Wind, Megala Smasher X for Water, and Gene Warped Warwolf for Earth. Unfortunately, with the banning of Christian Halky Fibrax and Mecha Phantom Beast of Warwadon, Magic Key has seen a lot less play in recent times, but it's definitely one of the most unique strategies for playing normal monsters, and even does a good job of linking them to the ritual part of the deck and allowing for a variety of different normal monsters to see some amount of play. Shining the Light at number 8 is Piercing the Darkness, a piece of Dark Magician focus support that subsequently ended up supporting a ton of different normal monster-centric strategies. 
Piercing the Darkness is a continuous spell with two effects, each one of them being a hard once per turn. Its first effect is basically an upstart goblin, and lets you draw a free card whenever you normal or special summon a non-token normal monster to the field. Effectively being a raw plus one in card advantage, since you would still control Pierce in the Darkness and can use it again on subsequent turns. And its second effect makes it so that whenever an attack is declared involving an opponent's monster, and a monster that you control that is either a level 5 or higher normal monster, or a monster that was Ritual, Fusion, Synchro, or XC summon using a normal monster as a material, that monster then gains attack equal to your opponent's monster's attack, basically making it a free honest that you don't have to discard for. Now, a lot of Dark Magician support cards like this one are usually centered around supporting a normal monster but they're usually directly tied to just supporting the Dark Magician rather than as a general support. For what it's worth, it does a good job of it, with cards like Red-Eyes Dark Dragoon making Dark Magician one of the most competitively played normal monsters in the modern era. But Piercing the Darkness is an anomaly that can pretty much be used in any deck that can consistently bring out normal monsters, which is why it sees consistent play in Suship. You see, Suship is a strategy that revolves around Gukin's Suship Shari, because having it in rotation usually makes it a lot easier to summon out your other Suship monsters, and if you summon out a Suship XC's monster using Shari as one of its materials, you'll also get to draw a free card. So because the deck is bringing Shari to the field consistently anyways, Piercing the Darkness is a great addition, because now you're drawing two cards per turn by using Shari as a material, one from Piercing the Darkness and one from the Suship you summon. But that's not all. You see, because you already want to summon your Suship XCs using Shari's material, most of the XCs you summon will be able to take advantage of the attack gain that Pierce the Darkness gives, especially since the attack lasts until the end of the turn. This is important for cards like Gukin Suship Ikura Class Dreadnought, which, after inflicting battle damage to your opponent, can target and destroy any card your opponent controls. And if you summon Ikura Class using Suship Ikura as a material, you also get to attack twice, making OT Kane superbly easy. Pierce in the Darkness sees rare play in actual Dark Magician decks, but it's fascinating to see how the card that was designed for a specific archetype can find more of a home in a deck that's completely unrelated to it, and even end up as one of the deck's main staples, despite how strange the combination of Dark Magic and Sushi first sounds. And diving into number 7 is Fish Sonar, a normal spell that's a really useful tool in any Umi-focused water deck. Because with Fish Sonar, you get a choice of either searching for a level 7 or lower effect monster that mentions Umi in its text, or you can instead search for any level 7 or lower normal monster instead. And after you finish searching, if Umi is face up on the field, you get to special summon any water normal monster from your deck, with this effect being a hard once per turn. In part 1, we discuss how Pacifus the Phantasm City is one of the strongest pieces of normal monster support in the game, and has allowed for normal monsters like Megalus Smasher X to have a deck to call home. And because Pacifus is technically treated as Umi, Fish Sonar is a solid piece of support for the deck, as it gives you another way of searching Megalus Smasher X to trigger your Pacifus and apply more pressure on your opponent. But the deck where Fish Sonar shines the most isn't in Pacifus, it's actually in Kairi Shin focused strategies. Ocean Dragon Lord Kairi Shin is a retrain of the original version of Kairi Shin designed to work directly with Umi, because while Umi is face up on the field, each player can only control a single non water monster, which is capable of floodgating most decks out of the game entirely. So most of the deck is based around trying to get Kairi Shin and Umi onto the field as quickly as possible, with cards like Electric Jellyfish. And because both Electric Jellyfish and the new Kairi Shin both mention Umi in their effect, Fish Sonar is a perfect fit for the strategy, letting you search for two of its most important monsters. However, in order to use its bonus effect and apply Kairishin's Floodgate, you do still need to have a copy of Umi face up on the field, which is why this particular strategy chooses to play a Legendary Ocean. This way you have more ways to search for your copy of Umi in Warrior of Atlantis, and a Legendary Ocean's benefit is also a boon for the strategy, because it's not just an attack boost, it level modulates all water monsters in hand and on the field to be one level lower. This makes Kairi Shin a normal summonable monster without tribute, and because a Legendary Ocean is always treated as Umi, you fulfill the conditions necessary to apply Kairi Shin's Floodgate and to special summon out a strong normal monster from your deck with Fish Sonar. But, as well as making Kairi Shin easier to summon, a Legendary Ocean also influences the normal monster of choice that you want to summon with Fish Sonar's bonus effect. You see, if it was just based on attack set alone, Fish Sonar would likely always be summoning out Gogiga Gagagigo since it happens to be the highest attack water normal monster in the game, but because it's a level 8 monster, it's a card that's really hard to summon if you've drawn it since Fish Sonar can only summon from the deck. So Kairi Shin decks instead choose to play Giga Gagagigo, a monster with 500 less attack than its Goga Giga counterpart, but because it's a level 5, it can also be searched with Fish Sonar and turned into a level 4 by Legendary Ocean. This makes it so that even if you draw the normal monster brick, it's not that bad. Because of the Legendary Ocean, you can just normal summon to the field without having to tribute. Overall, Fish Sonar is a solid inclusion to Umi focus strategies as a whole, and in Kairi Shin specifically, has managed to allow for a somewhat obscure but fan favorite normal monster to see some amount of play. Even if it isn't the center of the strategy itself, Giga Gaga Gigo is still a great card for the deck to include. Tributing into number 6 is Advanced Ritual Art and High Ritual Art. 
two ritual spells that are designed specifically to use normal monsters as materials for ritual summons. These cards do this in different but similar ways. Advanced Ritual Arts lets you ritual summon a monster from your hand by using normal monsters from your deck as material, as long as the levels of those monsters sent add up to be the exact same as the monster you're trying to summon. Whereas High Ritual Art needs you to tribute normal monsters whose levels are equaled exactly to the ritual monster you're trying to summon, but it's the reverse of Advanced Ritual Art, where instead you tribute normal monsters that are in your hand to summon out a ritual monster that's in your deck. Now, between the two, Advanced Ritual Art is the card that's seen the most amount of competitive success, since it's a lot older and has had more time to shine in decks like Demise of Decay, which summon Demise, King of Armageddon, using Insect Knight and Neo Bug from your deck to load up your graveyard with enough insects in the graveyard to summon out Doomdozer, which made Advanced Ritual Art a pretty effective OTK tool in this context. In the modern era, though, both Advanced Ritual Art and High Ritual Art are just about on equal footing. Most ritual-focused decks have a way of using ritual summoning that's more conductive to their game plan, so it doesn't really make sense to play a bunch of random vanilla monsters that could cause you to brick really badly. However, there are a number of different ritual-based strategies where using normal monsters is part of their main game plan, and both Advanced Ritual Art and High Ritual Art are incredible tools for these strategies. Earlier in this list, we talked about how Magic Key monsters benefit from either having used normal monsters of different attributes for the summon, or just benefit from having normal monsters of different attributes in the graveyard. This makes Advanced Ritual Art a perfect fit into the strategy, because you're already incentivized to play a bunch of different normal monsters. So with Advanced Ritual Art, you can send them from the deck to the graveyard to load up with beneficial attributes. And if you're summoning out Gears Glasser, it makes its negate really easy to access, since you can just send any two level normal monsters of different attributes. Blue Eyes decks can also take use of either Advance or High Ritual Art, since it's likely they're always going to have a Blue Eyes White Dragon available in their hand or deck. These ritual-focused Blue Eyes decks use their Ritual Arts in order to turbo out Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon to OTK your opponent as quickly as possible by sending Blue Eyes White Dragon from their hand or deck as material. Advanced Ritual Art and High Ritual Art might not see the same heights of competitive play that Advanced Ritual Art once had, but both cards are really interesting for how they've managed to turn normal monsters into a solid option for ritual strategies. And if there's ever any good ritual deck in the meta that uses normal monsters, it's likely that at least one of these cards is going to be in people's deck lists. And summoning in at number 5 is Summoner's Art, a normal spell which has the most simple effect out of any of the cards on this list. Because all Summoner's Art does is add any level 5 or higher normal monster from your deck to your hand. Now, at first glance, this effect seems interesting but relatively niche because there's very few high level normal monsters in the game that you really want to add to your hand. But a really important aspect of Summoner's Art is that it can search for normal pendulum monsters, which gives Summoner's Art a lot of utility in pendulum decks that play at least one normal scale. One of the earliest decks which could easily play Summoner's Art was Cleaford, because while the deck is mainly composed of effect monsters, two of its strongest cards happen to be high-level normal monsters. There is Cleaford Monolith, a scale 1 whose effect is basically super rejuvenation for Cleafords, allowing you to draw a number of cards near the end phase equal to the number of Cleave monsters ever attributed this turn. But there's also Cleaford Scout, the stronger of the two Cleaford normal monsters. Scout is a scale 9 whose pendulum effect allows you to pay 800 life points to search for any Cleave card from your deck. This could be a regular Cleaford monster, an Apocalyphort monster, or even your Cleaford Floodgates like Recolate. But it's not just in Cleaford where Summoner's Art saw play, because it also saw a decent amount of competitive play in Metal Foes decks since it can search out Metal Foes Volflame, a scale 8 that, like most Metal Foes, has a pendulum effect that lets you destroy a face of card you control to set a Metal Foes spell or trap card from your deck. This meant that decks like Zodiac Metal Foes got even more consistent with the inclusion of Summoner's Arc, as it made it even more likely that you were going to be able to find Volflim to pop your own scales to fill up your extra deck or your own Zodiac monsters to trigger their destruction effects. Whether in Metal Foes, Cleafort, or any other deck hoping to take advantage of powerful normal monsters that happen to be Pendulums, Summoner's Art is an amazing consistency tool. A lot of these cards would and do still see play even without Summoner's Art, but being around makes high-level normal Pendulums a lot stronger. And infesting the number 4 spot is Goki Paul, another card that's designed to increase the strength of normal insect-type monsters with its really powerful graveyard effect. Because whenever Goki Paul is sent to the graveyard, you can add any level 4 insect-type monster from your deck to your hand, which is already a solid effect in general. But if you choose to add a normal monster, you get to special summon that monster from your hand for free. And then you can choose to destroy any monster in the field whose attack is equal to or greater than the attack of the monster you summoned. Now, being a rota for any level 4 insect monsters made Goki Pole a solid addition to any strategy that's capable of easily sending cards to the graveyard. And you'll often see Goki Pole played in grass decks or decks that play a ton of danger monsters since it can be used to add danger mothman to the hand. But in more insect focused strategies, Goki Pole has much wider utility. In B-Trooper decks, you can use Goki Pole normally as an incredibly powerful searcher that you can use to get some of your strongest extenders, like the aforementioned Mothman and Assault Roller. But if you choose to play a normal monster in your deck, Goki Pole acts as an extender by itself that's also an amazing going second tool. You see, because of how strong Goki Pole's bonus effects are, B-Trooper decks are often incentivized to play a level 4 normal monster to be able to make Goki Pole even more impactful. 
especially since the deck could easily get Gokipol to the graveyard some way or another with the likes of Pico Falena, or by linking it off for B-Trooper Armor Horn. And there was actually a lot of thought that went into the particular normal monster that most B-Trooper decks would decide to play, because it's not worth it to play the level 4 Insect monster with the highest attack, because that means it's harder to use Gokipol's pop against monsters with lower stats. As a result, the best normal monster that people played alongside Gokipol wasn't Shiny Black Sea Squatter, it was Killer Needle, the lowest attack level 4 normal insect type monster in the TCG, whose wind typing also made it on Gokipol even acted as an out of barrier statue of the Stormwinds. Gokipol is an incredibly strong generic tool for insects, that's even great if you don't want to play a normal monster in your deck. But if you go the extra mile and play a copy of Killer Needle, it more than rewards you for the potential brick. And planting its roots at number 3 is Sun Avalon Dryas, a Link 1 monster that made Sun Sea Genus Loci an amazing inclusion in almost any plant deck. You can go into Dryas using any level 4 or lower plant monster, but if you specifically use Sun Sea Genus Loci, you can then add a Sun Vine spell or trap card from your deck to your hand. Your opponent also can't target Dryas for attacks, but it lets them attack you directly. This might seem like a negative at first, but it plays into Dryas' third effect, which lets you special summon out a Sunvine monster from your extra deck if you take any battle or effect damage, all while letting you gain life points equal to the damage you took. Now, each of these effects is amazing in their own right, but it's Dryas' first and third effect which has allowed for Genius Loci to be an incredible card for plant decks because it turns a single Genius Loci into a ton of free bodies. By bringing Loci to the field, you can then link into Dryas. Dryas then lets you search out Sunvine Sewing from your deck, and Sunvine Sewing lets you summon out any Sunseed monster from your deck, provided that you control a Sun Avalon Link monster like Dryas, and then you take 1000 damage. The monster to be summoned with this effect is Sunseed Twin, which on summon can be used to bring back Genius Loci that you linked off, resulting in at least three bodies already. But that's not all, because you also get to trigger Dryas' third effect because you took effect damage from your own Sunvine Sewing allowing you to use the effect of Dryas to summon out Sunvine Healer from your extra deck, resulting in four plant bodies off of a single normal monster. Now, you are locked into only being able to special summon out plant monsters from your extra deck for the rest of the turn, but these four bodies alone represent a ton of possibilities, and let you link into Aroma Seraphi Jasmine to special summon out any plant monster from your deck, which you can change depending on where you're playing the Sun Avalon engine. In Therion Sun Avalon, you'll be likely to summon out Aroma Mage Laurel to trigger the search effect of Jasmine to grab Therion Lily Borea. Or in Rika Sun Avalon, you can instead use the effect to bring out Rika Petal from your deck since it gives you access to the rest of your Rika engine. It's honestly impressive how much advantage a single normal monster can get you with a broken Link 1. In the last list, we talked about how strong of a tool Link Spider is for extension, but Dryas is an even more absurd tool that shows how the cards around a monster are just as important for making that monster good as the monster itself. And haunting the number 2 spot is Tenyi Spirit Vishuda, one of the strongest Tenyi monsters in the game due to its powerful removal effect. Vishuda has two effects. Its first effect is the same as every main deck Tenyi monster, and lets you special summon from the hand for free if you don't control any effect monsters. And just like the other main deck Tenyis, it also has a bonus effect which can be activated in the hand or graveyard by banishing Vishuda when you have a face-up non-effect monster. In the case of Vishuda, you get to target a card your opponent controls and bounce it to the hand. In part 1, we talked about how strong the Tenyi archetype as a whole is at supporting normal and non-effect monsters, and Fist of the Unrivaled Tenyi even managed to get a top 5 spot for how it acted as both a negate and as a waking the dragon for non-effect monsters. But for as strong as the Tenyi cards were back then, they didn't really have a home in any deck outside of their main archetype. However, since then, the Tenyis have actually been splashed into quite a few different strategies, since they can act as beneficial bodies whose hand and graveyard effects can also work on whatever normal monsters and tokens that a particular deck may play. One of the best examples of a deck where the Tenyi shine is Sword Soul, a deck which would use the Tenyi spirits Adhara, Ashuna, Shathada, and Vishuda with Adhara, Ashuna, and Vishuda forming a compact engine which can easily make Synchro 8s. By linking off a special summon Ashuna into Monk, you can special summon Adhara from your hand, and then use the effect of Ashuna in the graveyard to special summon Vishuna for the deck for a free Synchro 8 without even using your normal summon. And even if you don't have the two Tenyus that you need to combo, each of the individual Tenyu spirits are strong in their own right after you link them off for Monk. Ashuna gets its special from the deck, Adhara is amazing for follow-up by letting you add any banished worm monster to your hand, and Vishuda is an incredible going second tool. Shathana, on the other hand, wasn't really used in the same way as any of the other Tenyis, and was instead used to play through your opponent's hand traps alongside Heavenly Dragon Circle, which you would use to tribute Moye that your opponent was targeting with infinite permanence to add Shathana to your hand. Essentially, the Tenyis add a lot of strength and complexity to the Sword Soul strategy for how they can be used as worms, and as well as alongside the Sword Soul token and monk. But as well as the Sword Soul, there was another deck which would also use the Tenyis to great effect, Rose Dragon Synchros. These decks would use the strong level 7 Tenyi Spirits to act as free Synchro materials with strong level 3 tuners like Red Rose Dragon to easily access level 10 Synchros. 
But you might be surprised to know that as well as the Tenyis, this strategy also played a token engine alongside the Tenyis that also happens to be the number one spot on this list. And at number one, we have Rite of Aramisir. A normal spell which summons out the Adventure Token, one of the most competitively successful token monsters in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. Rite only has a single effect, but it has multiple parts to it. When you activate Rite, you get to special summon an Adventure Token to your field, but you can only activate so long as you don't control an Adventure Token already. Then, if you don't control a Fateful Adventure, you can place one from your deck directly into your Spell and Trap card zone. But this all comes with a restriction which prevents you from using on-field effects of any normal summoned monsters for the entire turn. This restriction is important because it does disqualify certain strategies from being able to use the Adventure Engine because they care too much about the effects of their particular normal summon. However, even in spite of this restriction, the Adventure Engine is still insanely splashable and has seen consistent competitive play since it was released because of how strong it is, with some decks even adapting their entire list just so they can take advantage of it. Decks like Prank Kids and Catch Tira don't really need to worry about losing their on-field effects to normal summon monsters. But a deck like Branded would play fewer copies of Aluber just so they could more easily use the Adventure Engine in its main payoff, Wandering Griffin Rider. Because Wandering Griffin Rider is basically just a free negate while you control the Adventure token, and can be easily searched with the effect of Fateful Adventure. Essentially, Griffin Rider gave the deck so they were willing to play the Adventure Engine an easy answer for some of their biggest counters. Cash Tira, for example, will often play the Adventure Engine in order to bring out a negate before their fifth summon to beat Nibiru, while Branded decks would instead use a negate to stop Ash Blossom on their Branded Fusion. This meant that if you were willing to play the Adventure Engine, you had a really solid tool that could be used to insulate your main combo lines. And that's not the only thing the Adventure Engine provides, because by equipping Draco back the Rideable Dragon onto a non-effect monster you control, you can bounce any card your opponent controls to the hand, making it great at clearing away your opponent's boss monsters and their floodgates. And just like Griffin Rider, you had easy access to Draco back with the effect of the Fateful Adventure you placed with Rite. It's astonishing how strong the Adventure Engine is for being based entirely around a monster with no effect but the cards around it make it so powerful that if a deck can play the Adventure Engine, it becomes a key benefit to the strategy. And this splashed ability is a big reason why this token-centric engine has received hits on the OCG and Master Duel ban list. But at least in the TCG, there is no doubt that it's one of the strongest non-effect-based engines in the game. Alright, and that's the list. If you know of any other normal support we might have missed, or have any ideas of Part 2s of any of our other older Top 10 videos, please let us know down in the comments below.